Welcome to our Catechism Lesson number 29, which considers the first petition of the Lord's Prayer. You'll study Catechism Questions 208 to 211 and complete Lesson 29 in your workbook. The Lord's Prayer easily divides into four parts based on its wording. There is the introduction, which addresses and describes God much like a short creed. There are three thy petitions that ask for God to act in his creation. Then follows four us petitions that request God's help with specific needs of God's people. Finally, there is the closing doxology and amen as we typically pray the prayer at church. So Jesus teaches us to pray for things universally, that is, things in heaven and earth, before praying for ourselves. In other words, he's teaching us to align our thoughts and prayers with God's created order, then consider our own needs. The creed-like introduction and the concluding amen teach us that the entire enterprise of prayer is one of faith. It is meditation and mindful, but it's not just meditation focused inward on ourselves. Instead, prayer connects us with our Father, his created order, and with one another as his people. Let's begin by reciting that Lord's Prayer together. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John the Baptist taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. As we learned when we studied the Creed, there are three persons of the Godhead, or Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Bible includes many other names for God as one and for individual persons of that Holy Trinity. In this section, we'll study some of these names and learn about their uses. When we study the Second Commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, we learn that God wants us to treat his name, his reputation, with respect. Between the time of the Old Testament and the coming of Jesus, people hesitated or even feared to use God's personal Old Testament name, Yahweh, because they were afraid of breaking that second commandment. However, the Lord wants us to use his personal name as well as the many other names in the Bible, that describe him, who he is. Here briefly are some of those names or titles for God as one. Yahweh. This is the most common name for God in the Old Testament. It literally means he is. The name teaches us that God exists and that he has always existed. We call it God's personal name because it so often is used to describe his personal care for his people. God, a title likely referring to power or authority. In the Old Testament, this title is used for false gods as well as the true God, Yahweh. The word is actually plural, more than one. But when used for the true God, it always has a singular verb. So, for example, in the first verse of the Bible, we don't have the gods created. We have God created. 
that plural title, hints in the Old Testament that God is triune before the Lord fully revealed all the persons of the Holy Trinity, as happens progressively and later. Lord. This title is the common one used when talking about a Lord or a ruler and his servants. It reminds us of God's rulership over his creation. Almighty. This name is a bit mysterious. The custom is to translate it almighty, but it probably describes God's providence that he provides for his people. Most High. This is another common title for God in the Old Testament that describes the fact that God is above and beyond all of his creation. There is no one like him. Those are all common names for the unity of God. Let's look now at some names and titles for particular persons of that Holy Trinity. Father describes the first person of the Holy Trinity. God is the source and provider of all things. Creator describes that first act mentioned in the Bible when God made all of physical and spiritual reality. God the Father worked through the Son and the Holy Spirit to bring about his creation, as we read later in the Bible. Son. Son describes the second person of the Holy Trinity and his unique relationship with the Father. He is the only begotten Son who shares the essence of his Father eternally. Jesus, our Lord's earthly name, which fittingly means Yahweh saves. Messiah or Christ, these literally mean anointed one. The title describes how the Heavenly Father set Jesus apart from everyone else to be our only Savior. Word. Word describes how the Heavenly Father speaks to us and works in our lives through his only begotten Son. Jesus is the unique mediator between God and mankind because Jesus is both God and man in one person. Lamb of God. This describes Jesus as that perfect sacrifice for our sins and the sins of the whole world. Holy Spirit, or often just Spirit, describes the third person of the Holy Trinity. Spirit emphasizes that God's essence is not physical or earthly. He is holy, special, unique among all beings. Comforter or counselor or helper, depending on the translation you use. Comforter is a special title that Jesus gives to the Holy Spirit before he goes to die for us upon the cross. Jesus promised that he and the Father would send us the Holy Spirit to be with us throughout our lives and to comfort or guide us in life. There are many, many other names for the unity of God and for the persons of the Trinity in the Bible. These names and titles describe aspects of who God is. And as we pray, we may select one such name that connects us with the things we are praying for. For example, if I'm praying for physical needs, such as daily bread, I might begin my prayer with Father. If I'm praying for forgiveness, such as during the season of Lent, I might begin my prayer with the name of Jesus, Lamb of God. And if I'm praying for peace in my life, I may address the Holy Spirit as my comforter. Listen for these various names and titles as we pray those formal prayers at church and sing our hymns. Watch for them also as you study the Bible and the Catechism.
Jesus teaches us to pray, Hallowed be thy name. There's an Old Testament story about the Lord and Moses that beautifully illustrates this petition. Israel had just gone badly astray from the covenant that God was making with them. While Moses was up in the mountain receiving the words of the covenant, the people of Israel made a golden calf and began to worship other gods. Moses put a stop to all this, but went back up Mount Sinai discouraged. How was he to lead this rebellious people? Moses prayed, show me your ways. And the Lord promised to be with Moses. And Moses added, show me your glory. The Lord told him that he could not show him his glory. God is too holy and glorious for mankind to even see. But he did promise to hide Moses in the cleft of the rock and pass by him, declaring his name Yahweh. And here is what God said. Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. As God declared his name, he also declared his ways to Moses. The law threatening to punish the guilty and the gospel promising steadfast love, faithfulness, and forgiveness. As Moses heard, he quickly bowed his head and worshiped before God. Hallowed is his name.